Hey, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today. We're going to go ahead and get started and know right up front, there is a lot of information that I am covering today. So thank you for joining us. Uh, be patient if some of what I'm talking about isn't related to exactly the degree you're looking for. And know that I'm going to be taking some questions in the chat function. I probably won't be able to answer it as I'm trying to cover things fairly quickly and together. But when Ashley comes in and talks about the career, I will then come back to those questions and we'll stop the recording at that time. And then we'll go back and maybe you can even unmute yourself and ask the question if that's even easier. So we're going to get started. Um, today, we're covering the international affairs degrees. Now, specifically, this will be more about the Master of International Affairs, but we do have a number of other programs that I will discuss. So today, we're going to be covering with a couple of people. So I'm going to be the main presenter. I'm Katherine Meyer. I work with the admissions and recruitment side of the house. And then Ashley Winter Road will join us towards the end and cover the career services and some of the support services that we have for our students, including some of the aspects of writing programs and, lead, and uh, leadership and some of the study abroads. So we'll have a little bit of a, a break from hearing me talk the entire time. Now, the MIA agenda here, it's mainly, again, focused on this degree, um, but we're also going to cover the five-year program with that MIA. There are two now combined programs that we share with other departments, so they're three-year degrees. And we have the Master of International Policy, which is a one-year program. I'm going to talk about their all their tracks and concentrations. Many of them are shared. We're going to talk about the capstone projects, a little bit about the degrees themselves and what they consist of and how maybe they look a little different. We'll talk about their admissions uh, process and the stats uh, for the incoming class this year. I'll also end with some of the funding and the cost before passing that over to Ashley to talk about professional development, career services, student groups, how you can get involved. And then I'll shut the recording down and we'll do Q&A. So I'm going to start with just the generic slide. What is the Bush School of Government? So we are an undergrad and graduate school here at Texas A&M. We opened in 97. Um, our first class graduated in 99 with a whopping 19 students. We are now bringing in much more robust classes, numbering anywhere between 80 to 100 for the MIA and MPSA programs. And thus far, we've graduated about 2,800 master's alumni from our programs. Now, the master's degrees consists of three different modalities of how they're offered. There's five of these that are offered in College Station, and that's what I'm covering today. There's also two degrees that are offered in the Washington, D.C. location, but I am not covering them. You would have to go to the D.C. part of the website, and they can tell you about that national security and intelligence and their MIP version. And then there's also one executive online program with the Master of Public Service executive degree, um, also not what I'm covering. I'll be covering that one. Um, the MPSA tomorrow, and then the executive MPSA, they will have their own webinar that's listed on our uh, recruiting page. There are also six graduate certificates, and I have one slide just to mention them because sometimes students do those grad certificates with their degree. But essentially, we're preparing students for a career in a number of fields, and I've just listed them here, nonprofits, uh, all levels of government, government contractors, private industry. It runs the gamut. Some will continue on for education with maybe a PhD or a JD, but most of this, this is a terminal degree. So who are we looking for? Um, get this question all the time. Motivated students, people who are smart, hardworking, um, often those with a calling to public service. Um, it doesn't have to be public service. It could go into the private industry. Obviously, that fills a lot of people's needs. Um, but here at the Bush School and just at Texas A&M in general, it's a lot of that giving back. Um, and so public service does fit with a lot of their career aspects. And then mature and passionate professionals. So sometimes that means people have gone out and worked for a couple of years and come back. But many times here in College Station area, if you think you're ready, now's the time to apply and see what happens. Um, our faculty are willing to take a lot of younger students if they are ready for the program. And here at the Bush School, you're going to work individually and as part of a team. So when we do interviews with students, we're also trying to figure out how you work with others. You can't be that lone wolf on your own. You won't survive here in terms of the amount of reading you're doing. Uh, we're building those skill sets for the 
jobs you will have later where you will have to work with people. Um, we're developing your knowledge, skills, and abilities in that area that you're looking to um, focus within. And we're preparing you for your professional life wherever that leads. That first job out is probably not the job you're going to have maybe five to 10 years down the line. You're probably moving up the ladder, maybe even switching fields. We're going to give you those skill sets to continue moving forward. And you're going to build lifelong personal and professional connections so that when you are ready to make a change, you can reach out back to the Bush School or your fellow colleagues who you graduated with or the class before you and you know make those connections. Connections and, and keep, like I said, moving forward. So we're going to start with the Master of International Affairs. So this degree is a two-year program, 48 credit hours. We start each fall. So that means you're doing fall with 12 hours, spring 12 hours, summer internship, fall, and then spring again for those 12 hours. So it's 48 credit hours to get it. You're building a degree that's relevant to your interests because there are 11 electives put into this program that you can mix and match with your concentrations, which we will cover next. You're receiving both faculty and career advising. So you're never on your own. You can get some help, um, talk to people, talk to employers, and uh, really just formulate where you wanna head with this. You're also completing either a relevant summer internship or a language immersion. It's your choice which one fits better for your plan. You also need to pass a foreign language test for a graduation requirement. So at the time that you're applying, we want to know what your current level is in a foreign language and just knowing that you can be able to pass that test um, before you graduate. Now we'll provide some support. I'll cover that in a minute uh, to help you get there, but you are not taking courses in foreign language. That is just an outside attainment and, you know, keeping up with it. You're also going to collaborate on a client capstone project with your classmates, and that's going to happen in the final semester. I've got some slides later that will cover what some of those look like. And basically, you're gaining this flexibility. Um, you can take a few online elective courses if you would like, because we do have certificate programs that are um, offered in that format for online. But just know that it does cost an additional $1,500 per class that you do that. And for that reason, most students do take their uh, courses here in College Station in, uh, on campus. Now, this only applies to electives. Core courses must be taken on campus. And we'll talk about those certificates. But you can uh, transfer up to 12 credit hours, can double count both for them and for the master's degree. So the tracks that we use um, for the MIA for the MIA combined degrees and for the MIP are all the same. Here in College Station, we offer international development and economic policy and national security and diplomacy. So when you're applying, you're gonna apply to one of those two tracks. Now, if you're interested in both, know that you're not locked out of taking classes from the other side. So if you're really looking at international development, you know, yeah, I, I like that, but I wanna take a couple of security classes. You can do that. Only one of the concentrations, because you have to choose at least two for the MIA and the combined, only one has to be tied to your track. The second one can be any of them. So if you're doing IDEP, you may want to focus on international economic development for one of your concentrations, and your second concentration can be any of them. So it's a good way to mix and match. With the MIP, you will have to choose a track, but the concentrations are elective. You don't have to pick one like the MIA and the MIA combined does. So I've listed those there, lots of choices. Um, know that most classes, sorry, most concentrations have at least six to probably 15 classes that are listed and you just have to figure out which ones are being offered that semester. Now, the curriculum, as I said, there's four core classes, one track course, and 11 electives. So in your first year, you're going to get, here's what you need to take between quantitative methods one, for instance. That can be done either in the fall or the spring, just depending what's available. And those are first come, first serve. Many of them do fill up. So sometimes you're forced to move something to another semester just because you can't get into it. Now, as far as the track requirement goes, just know that IDEP requires quant methods too. National security requires the American foreign policy. But you're just pushing in those electives as you desire. Uh, so lots of flexibility with that. And notice in semester four, there is a capstone seminar there. Again, you'll have some choice in those classes. 
So I just put a couple of sample courses here. So within a concentration, there's, like I said, between five to maybe 15 different courses listed there. So I've just listed a few here so you can see the depth of them and the interest of them. So I've picked American diplomacy, for instance, you've got you know a handful here that are listed. Um, same thing with conflict and development in the bottom. The reason that one's uh, colored in brown as opposed to that reddish color is because it's a cross-listed course. It's both for international development and for national security. So either side can take it and in, it, lots of choices. Very interesting work with our faculty. Um, so don't need to read them out, but they're there for you to look at. And that's also available on the website through the curriculum, or you can email me and I'll send you a sheet that's easy to print and look at. So the capstones, this is a nine month, I said that wrong. This is not nine month. This is a five month. Um, this is yours is a, um, done for a semester. So my, my fault on that one, five month team-based consulting project. So it's students are integrating and applying their knowledge from the coursework that they've been doing over the past year and a half. And they're going to get a list of capstone courses that the faculty are working with clients that year. And in that presentation in the fall, the faculty are going to tell you, here's the client, here's the kind of work we're going to do for it, the scope of it. And then you're going to then rank order your preferences. And then the department is going to choose which one you get. Typically, you're going to get one of your first two choices. And you will undertake that in the spring of your final year. Um, so it requires teamwork, initiative, leadership skills, writing and leadership staff may consult with your capstone group so that you guys understand how each other is learning, what kind of writing aspects you need to pay attention to, um, documentation. But the clients that we are enlisting to do consulting work for, a lot of them are going to be the same kind of career agencies. So state, nonprofit, federal, private, local, community. Now, the MIA capstone titles, I've listed for spring of 22. I don't have the 23. Uh, unfortunately, assistant is kind of busy and then hasn't passed that on. Uh, but you're going to see the client. We have the World Bank, the Sufan Center, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, Department of State, U.S. Space Force, uh, China and Russia um, was the client, uh, Cybercom. And then you also had CIA as one of them. So lots of interesting work. You get to hear about what those um, projects are, and then you're going to, like I said, rank order them and get a, a choice in that. And you're typically working with between five to 10 students for that project. Um, lots, lots of here, but with that class, you know, is 85 students. So it looks like most of these would be somewhere closer to that five to seven per, per capstone, depending on the popularity. Now, the Texas A&M connection is another great aspect about being here at A&M because you can tailor your degree to your interests and those interests sometimes even fall outside of our programs. So the ag leadership and education has classes, computer science has classes our students are taking, geography, land development, statistics, public health, nuclear engineering, lots of choices. And you're going to see that these classes are listed on the curriculum when you're looking it up. So it's not like you have to go digging through the um, the book at A&M and figure out what classes can I do. They're going to be listed there for you. But if you do hear of one and are interested, you just work with your advisor, which is a faculty member that will be assigned to you, and get permission to take that class and get permission from the faculty who is leading that class. And you can work that into your degree plan. All right. Now, to come off that MIA for a second, we're going to talk about the joint degrees. So the MIA here at Texas A&M is partnering with two bachelor's programs. Now, international affairs is already under us here at the Bush School. And then we've got the economics, which is just a building over. So the students who are majoring at Texas A&M in these areas can work with their undergraduate advisors and just make sure that they are taking coursework and setting aside some coursework so that by the time that they enroll with us by their senior year, they're able to double count some of our graduate work for their undergraduate classes. So it's saving them essentially a year's worth of classes and it's saving them some money because you're being charged undergrad rates. So the required GPA to get into this by the time that you enroll is a 3.25 for economics, a 3.5 for international affairs. It should be INTA. But you're applying as a junior when you're somewhere around that 70 to 80 hour mark and you're rolling when you're about 102 hours. 
So the benefits of a program like this is, again, saving some of that money. You're getting 18 credit hours of courses that are double counting. You're applying with an internal app, so it didn't cost you anything to apply. And you're earning both your bachelor and your master's in about five years. There's some that do it in four years because they're moving undergrad pretty quickly. And typically, though, we're only enrolling about six or so of these students each fall. So it is competitive. We're not bringing a lot of them in, um, but it does work for a handful of students each year to get here a little quicker. Now, the combined programs, we are doing the MIA and the MPH. So this is if students are wanting to do the Master of Public Health. So it's a three-year program. Between our two programs, it's 78 credit hours. You're applying to the MPH, not through the normal grad cast like that you typically do for us, for the MIA. You need to apply through the SOFUS program, um, which is what public health uses. And then once you've applied to them, you're also going to us and going to our website and applying through an internal application. And this just saves you from having to pay two different application fees. So we'll do an internal application. You're gonna spend your first year and a half with MPH. You then come to us in the spring of your second year and it'll spend a year and a half with us. In students who are in the MPH, you get a choice of two of their tracks, essentially, and it doesn't matter which one you choose. And then when you come to us, you're working with our tracks and concentrations. So you'll have a choice between the National Security and Diplomacy or IDEP, and then you can pick and choose your concentrations, just like everyone else is doing. Still need to do two of those. You're still required to the foreign language requirement needs to be met. And at least one capstone course and one internship between the two of us has to work. So you have to meet the requirements of both of those schools. As far as the aid goes, the Bush School funding that I'm gonna talk about later is only gonna apply when you're carrying the MIA full load. So when you're enrolled with the Bush School portion, when you're with public health, you'll need to work with them to see what kind of funding or waivers that they can offer. Now the econ, the economics MIA combined program is just now starting. This is a Master of Science in Economics. This is a little bit different, still three years, still 78 cre total credit hours, but you're going to apply to Econ first through GradCast, just like you would for the MIA, but you're not going to apply for the MIA until your first semester with them. So we're not going to do it at the same time. It's going to be a little bit of a lag on it, and you're going to do an in internal application. Same thing, save you some money, but you're going to spend one year with economics, then you come at one year with us. And then you've got to go back to economics, do a semester, and then back to us for a semester. In that time, you're also completing the requirements of both the capstone and the internship. And remember, you've still got to meet that foreign language requirement. So one unique thing about this as well is that because it's economics focused, we're asking those students, you need to come in under the IDEP track. But remember, you can still take some national security courses if you want. You just need to come in under the track. Same thing, any Bush School funding only applies when you're taking the MIA full load that semester. All right, now changing over to the Master of International Policy. I get a lot of people who say they're interested in this program, but they haven't read the requirements for this. So this is a one year, 30 credit hour degree, but you must have four years of professional international experience. So not you know, an undergrad, I did a study abroad for three months and you start adding things up. It's really intending for those that have been post-graduation, who've been out in the workforce, out in the world, maybe it's military, maybe it's working for a company, and then coming back and then coming into courses. So typically, the average age for this group is going to be higher because you've got to have some work experience under your belt for it. Now, you are using the same MIA tracks and concentrations if you choose. It's just faster. You're only having to do 10 courses instead of the 16. Um, this is offered both in College Station and in DC, but the only part I'm covering is ours because they do look a little different. We do have applications accepted for fall, spring, and summer, which means it's a rolling admission, whereas the MIA only admits in the fall. There is no internship requirement because you've already worked. There's no capstone. You don't really need it. No foreign language that you have to bring in because a lot of them don't have time to work on that. But there's also no Bush School scholarship. So you can accept mili military benefits, 
and federal aid, but we don't have Bush School scholarships to help. So understand that the cost, the price tag you see later is going to be what you pay because I can't help you with waivers and I can't help with Bush School scholarship for that degree. So the MIP curriculum, again, shorter, it's two core courses, five tracks, three electives. And in the summer, you have two track courses you can take. Most, most of our students start fall, spring, and then do two courses in the summer. But it can you know, be different than that if you come in different semesters. But the same idea, you have the option of taking up to two courses online. So you may only have to be here in College Station for the fall and spring. And in the summer, you can go back out to wherever you need to be and take those two courses online. Just know that that's going to add $3,000 to your cost because each course online is about $1,500 more. Now, I talked earlier, graduate certificates, these are by no means required. Uh, these are just an opportunity. If someone wants to dip their toe and get an idea of what uh, our programs are like, what it's like to be in the classes, what is the instruction like, they can do graduate certificates. Maybe a student is even graduating in December, and because the MIA doesn't start until the fall, they've got the spring semester and don't know what to do. And in that case, they may want to start a certificate, because if you do two courses in the spring, then we will take those classes to into the MIA, and now you've got a couple of semesters, you can do nine hours instead of a typical 12. So it's a little less on your plate. So this does work for some students. Here at the Bush School, we offer the CAIA, which is Advanced International Affairs, and the Homeland Security. Those are the two that work the best with the international affairs programs. There's also nonprofit management, public management, also offered here at the Bush School. And they can still work, because remember, you've got electives. You can put together your own area of emphasis. So sometimes people have done international NGOs and have taken some of the nonprofit management courses. There's also certificates elsewhere at Texas A&M that are done through geospatial intelligence and cybersecurity policy. So those are options. There's a number of other ones on campus, but these are the ones that we work with the most. Certificates complement the MIA. You complete them online or on campus, depending on how they're offered. You can look for focus areas. Like for instance, the CAIA has focus areas. One of them is counterterrorism. And Texas A&M seniors can enroll in this program ahead of time. Otherwise, you have to have your degree in hand for undergrad. Then you can do these programs because they're graduate certificates. So students must apply and be admitted to the CAIA before starting the MIA if they want to do this. You can't decide once you're here and go, I think I want to take the certificate. It's too late. You're already in the master's program at that point. Um, so we can work with you, Bush School Online, our Office of Extended Ed runs those, and you can reach them at that, Bush School Online at texasanm.edu. All right, shifting gears a little bit, we're going to talk about the MIA admissions. So application requirements, this is standard for most programs. There's an application you have to fill out. We use GradCAS. Um, now, keep in mind, that's for the MIA, that's going to be for uh, the, most of the applicants who are coming to us. This is not part of the combined degrees, because remember, you're applying through those programs. Ours is an individual um, one that's done internally on the website. If you're a Texas A&M student already in a program and you're going, you know what, I really love being here and I think I can get more out of a second master's degree, you would transfer in through a different form. So you're not using GradCAS. And if you're a five-year student, then you're using an internal app. So you're not using GradCAS. Everybody else is including MIP students, which is on another slide. So the application fee is $89 if you're a domestic student from US. It's 114 if you're an international student. We only need unofficial transcripts of the time that you're applying. Official ones are only if you decide to enroll with us and you need to get those in pretty quickly um, because you can't register for classes until those are received by us. You still need three recommendations. I'm sorry for that. It just It's standard. We still need them for some of the scholarships we make nominations for. So we don't want to say two and then have to go back and ask for more. So it's three recommendations. Typically, um, faculty want to read more about how you're doing in people's classes. So faculty tend to be the mode of um, people requesting but obviously, if you've been out for a little bit or you can't figure out, I've got two really good ones and I don't know a third one, pick someone from work, internships, what have you. It's your choice on how you want to put these recommendations. Just make sure that they're positive, right? 
the resume we're going to need. We even have a sample resume on the website that you could use as an example. It doesn't have to look exactly like it. It's just there to remind you of some portions that we want to see, like study abroad and language ability. You are going to need a statement of purpose, and you are going to need an international experience essay. Just don't make them exactly the same. Statement of purpose is more about you know who you are, where you're coming from, what inspired you for this field, uh, where you hope you be, ultimately. International experience essay is about maybe travel you've done, your language ability, cultural interactions, you know, play with that and make it to your strengths. Now the GRE test, good news for most of you, we have now made it completely optional. It is encouraged if your GPA is below a 3.2 or if for whatever reason you think it can help your application. Um, so remember, when we're talking about financial aid later, if we've got 40 students who all have a 3.9 or better, 3.8 or better, who do we give those top scholarships to? Sometimes having a GRE test can help differentiate and make someone stand out, but by no means does it mean that a student has to have it to get those higher end awards. It's just another thing we can look at to decide who might get those really prestigious awards, fully funded kind of things, which there aren't many of. Now, if you're an international student, you will have to meet English proficiency test uh, requirements unless you meet it in another way. So there are certain countries that already do their instruction in English. If you're already doing the GRE and you meet a certain standard, then that works. Others are doing TOEFL, IELTS, um, having done a bachelor's degree in the U.S. There's a number of ways. So you can look at our website for that. And if you ever have questions, once you decide to apply, Bush School Applications at tnu.edu is the email address that Ashley will be on and she'll be happy to help you. And that'll be Ashley Treadway, um, who's on most of the emails that um, when I'm emailing you for prospective students. Now, combined admissions is very similar. Just know that, remember, it's an MIA internal application. It's on the website. If you're doing the MPH, it's a SOPUS application and fee. If you're doing uh, the GradCast with Econ, you're paying for theirs and then you'll do our internal. Same thing on official transcripts, three recommendations. We can use other department recs if you email us and let us know, because we're going to need to see them for ours. Same thing, you need resume, statement of purpose, international experience essay, GRE test, English proficiency. So that part's the same. It's just the main part of the application. The timeline for the MIA and the combined programs is we always open the application in early August. So it is open. If you're ready to start applying, it's good to go. December 15th is our priority funding deadline. Now we are pushing that deadline because it gives us time to process applications and get that in front of faculty over the holiday or in early January. Because if you wait until that final deadline, that's gonna be posted for, I think um, January 12th, I believe is it. Then their classes are starting that following week. And if they may not be in the best of moods if they're having to now review files. So really encourage you to hit that December 15th deadline. It just helps us get things moving and processed a little more smoothly. That final application deadline is posted for January 12th, but sometimes we'll move that back depending on how applications are going. We always get people who hit us up a few days later or even a week or two later and go, man, I missed the deadline. And we'll go, okay, well, it's, it's actually still open. You can apply. The only problem with applying late is that we can't guarantee that we're going to get it done in time to get those interviews before those first offers go out. Because sometimes we have to put those people on the back burner until we take care of the ones who hit the deadline. So committee is going to start reviewing those applications. They start rating them. We're also doing ratings when we do interviews in February. Now I put ICW, that's interview conference weekend. We're going to have an opportunity for students to come visit us in person and do their interviews in person. They can also do some uh, panels with our alumni and with our current students. There's opportunities to find out what kind of activities to get involved in. And that's gonna be held on February 23rd and 24th. That's a Friday, Saturday. So if you are really interested in trying to come to campus and meet us, hold those dates um, because we'll send invitations for that in January. Now, by early March, we're getting the final application review with the committee. We're also making financial aid decisions. So we're hoping by March 15th to get you both your admission and your scholarship um, letter emailed to you um, so that you can then read it and make a decision within a month. April 15th is a deadline, national deadline to accept or decline your offer. And please, 
please let every school that you apply to know yes or no. Don't just leave people hanging. We get that more and more now the days and we just need to know. And congratulations if you accept with someone else. Sometimes more funding is a, a key point. Just let everybody know about it. All this information um, is found online under admissions section of our website. Um, just go to the website, click on admissions, go to the degree of your choice and you'll find it all. Now, MIP admissions, same idea, GradCast app, app fee, unofficial transcripts, only you have two letters of rec to do, resume, statement of purpose, international experience, GRE test is optional, English language proficiency has to be met. So same thing I just covered, just barely different. Now, their admissions process and timeline, because they're a one-year program, we have rolling admissions for them. They can enroll each spring, summer, and fall. So early August, those applications are open for the year. Um, but you need to hit by your deadline date so that we can process. But because we're not doing interviews and we're not figuring out any financial aid, these are rolling decisions and they're given about seven to 10 days after a completed application. So it's much quicker. Um, whereas the MIA and the combined programs, you're going to work about a year out. So same thing, all online. Now, if you're curious, what does the class look like? Um, International Affairs Stats. Now, we didn't have any combined programs. The MPH the one person who was supposed to come in this year it decided not to, so he just reverted back to the MPH program. We've got some that are set to start in another year, but they're not included in my stats for fall of 23 or spring. So the enrollment this year for MIA, we came up with 93 students. Uh, we have an additional eight students covering from the fall and the spring. And then the average GPAs are listed. I took off the GRE because there's so few doing it, it, it doesn't really mean a lot. Average age, look at the difference of that. Now it's 23 is average age for MIA. Now, most of the years I've been here, I've been here 20 years, most of the time that's 24. I mean, dropped down a little bit the last two years. I've seen it up as high as 25. But the MIP, remember, those are people who have got the experience. That average age is 38. So they're in those same classes with you. So it adds a lot of depth to the classes. Women for the MIA is about half. So it's 48%. It's much fewer for the MIP. Students of color is really high this year. We had 36% up from 35% last year, 13% in the MIP. International students, we get a lot that are interested, but funding ends up being a hurdle for many of them. So unfortunately on the MIA side, and maybe because it's a national security focus largely, um, we don't get as many who decide to enroll, even though they're admitted. Um, so the number is 7% this year and none for the MIP. And part of that's the price tag because they don't get waivers and they don't get scholarships. So non-residents for the MIA is 40%. It's almost the same for the MIP. And then the average work experience. Now I included this because people will say, look, I just graduated. Do I have a chance? Because a lot of schools I see are telling me I need to wait two or three years. That is up to you. There's some validity to waiting a couple of years and working. Sure, it can help you pick out where you want to be. But there's also a, a thought process of going, if I stop and go work, am I ever coming back? And so that also is something you need to think about in pursuing this degree and when and what works for you. So in this case, zero to two years, this is much higher than last year's. Last year's was sitting under 60%. This year, it's 75%. Two to five years is 16%, and the five plus years is about nine to 10%. And it's 100% for MIP because they're required to have at least four years. Now, professors, you're learning from both seasoned practitioners, people who've been in the jobs and who are coming back with academics um, and teaching now and giving their you know, advice on how to do certain uh, memos and, and aspects to think about for simulations and running these. And then you've got your academics who are studying certain areas. This includes for the practitioners, we've got a former CIA director of operations, an administrator of USAID, an ambassador in the foreign service, military servicemen, and, and, and much more. Um, but the faculty here, by and large, are fantastic, very personable um, people that you're going to want to get to know, which is why it's great to do the interviews. And the average class size, most of our classes match out, max out at uh, 20. Some will get up to the 25 mark, but that means that's probably about 16 because I've seen some courses that are seven students, 10 students. So average is probably about 16. Okay, we're almost done with my part. Funding. Here's where you want to know, how, how can I get funding? What does this look like? Um, let's just cover this. Bush School Financial Awards. 
in year one, anyone that we admit for the MIA is going to get some level of scholarship. So 100% of our students. Now, if they drop to part-time, then they're not funded because it's only for full-time students. So you can receive a scholarship. And if you are out of state or out of country, you can receive that non-resident tuition waiver. And that non-resident waiver is worth about 12,700 because we do 24 credit hours and that's about what it's worth. So combined students, remember you're only receiving money when enrolled with us full-time. Scholarships we're getting, I put the range from one to 29,000. Most students are doing somewhere between three and 15. And so that's why when I put for fall of 23, 50% of our students got between 1,000 and 3,000, and most of those hit at 3,000. Another 30% were the 5,000 to 7,000, and then 20% of the students were the 10,000 and up. That includes the Robertson Fellowships, which are pretty much fully funded. The summer you have an additional opportunity for funding if you are taking an internship that doesn't give you payment. So it's an unpaid position. Now there's a requirement to have to attend some career workshops, but you can apply for that for both internship and for study of, um, for your language study. So for those that are doing that, you can apply for it as well. In year two, that scholarship renews at that same level. Remember, you gotta keep that GPA to 3.25 or better. The non-resident waiver is still in play, so you can still save money the second year. The only way you can move up in funding is by applying for competitive graduate assistantship. It's called GARS and Gantz here. In doing that, you're going to be working 20 hours a week for a faculty member or staff, and part of the consideration is your first year grades and you're fit for that position. And there's only about a dozen that are applicable for the MIA. So you're going to have a lot of competition because that class, this incoming class was 93. And only about 12 of them are going to get these GA positions. So most students are just renewing their scholarship. Others are competing. And if they don't get it, then they're going to renew. Now, the GA positions are worth about $20,000. So it's a nice jump if you came in at three or five. Now, as far as the funding and cost, now there's additional funding from Texas A&M. Now, we disperse the Robertson Foundation Fellowships as part of our level. That's that 29000 kind of level. There's also Coverdale Fellows that are Bush School Scholarships. We just renamed them. Um, it's not an on top of anything. Those two are included. Now, one that is on top of this is for Texas residents, you can apply for what's called the Texas Aggie Graduate Grant. You have to be under $10,000 in scholarship, but it's a need-based grant. It's good for an additional $5,000 a year. And they're first come, first serve. So we tell everybody, don't forget to apply this if you're from Texas. Fill out your FAFSA. You know what kind of loans you can have if you need them. Look for campus jobs, student worker positions with faculty. Jobs for Aggies is our job leaderboard that you can log in once you're a student here and look. And many of our students do work. Now, cost, estimated tuition and fees. Now, this is what you're going to see on the sheets. Texas residents, we run about $13.5 a year. Non-residents is about $26.4 a year. International, it's just over 31,000. But because we offer those scholarships and because we offer those non-resident tuition waivers, I just plugged in an average $5,000 amount. That just knocks down your costs in those blue numbers. Now, even the Texas and the non-residents, you're under 3,000, sorry, under uh, $9,000 for your tuition and fees that you have to pay. So that could be through a job, that could be through partial loans, very affordable, especially if you're looking at private schools. International is a little bit higher because you guys have international fees that you have to deal with. If you're a combined students, you need to combine, uh, contact public health and economics to see what kind of cost they are in that portion. But while you're with us, this is what you would look at. And just so you know, cost of living is estimated by A&M at about 21000 a year. If you're MIP costs, remember, there's no funding. So the price tag is what you see. It's 16.8 per year for Texas residents. It's 33 for non-residents. It's 37.6 for internationals. Just a little bit higher than the MIA. Up to two courses can be taken online for that additional cost. And it's affordability in the sense that it's a one-year program, not two. So you don't have all those additional living costs. You can apply for some outside scholarships. You can use your military benefits. You can submit FAFSA. This is available for that, for federal loans. 
and ask about job financial support. Maybe the military will do it. Maybe your job will help pay for it. It's one year. Uh, we have had some students do those options. Okay, so I'm gonna stop talking. I'm gonna put Ashley on and Ashley's gonna cover our professional development and career services for about the next 15 minutes. Howdy y'all, um, as Catherine said, my name is Ashley Winrode. I'm one of the assistant directors in our career services um, here at the Bush School. And so we're just- Ashley, I'm not hearing you at all. It oh. shows unmuted, but I'm not hearing you. Is anybody else having that? Okay, apparently that's just on me. Everyone else says that they're hearing you fine. So something's okay. not coming through on my end. Keep okay. going, Ashley. But everybody can hear me now? Is that is that accurate? Thumbs up, somebody in the chat. Awesome. Um, so I'm gonna talk through some of the stuff that we have um, available for you as students. Um, that are kind of that are built in to the program. Um, so we have a leadership program with one of our assistant directors for the leadership um, leadership workshops. And so this this semester, um, she's done like managing your time and stress management, and she does MBTI and strengths class with people. And so those are really really good. Um, kind of supplemental information that will help you develop professionally and personally as you're going through your program. Um, we also have an incredible writing program that's part of the Medal, for, Medal of Excellence. Um, and so what that does is they will help you um, build a portfolio that you're actually going to be able to use as you progress through your um, applications for your job applications and um, so they're what they're looking at is they're teaching you how to um, write briefs and write very effectively and use the bluff as a writing style it's bottom line up front and um, they're looking at using AI responsibly to prepare um, for your Medal of Excellence writing projects and things like that. And so those are incredible opportunities. And we also have a vast amount of speakers who come to our campus. Those are usually brought in through, um, sometimes they're brought in through our departments, but sometimes they're brought in through our institutes, which is what you'll see on the next slide. Um, we have international travel that's from our students. Um, our students are able to travel abroad sometimes because of classes. Sometimes they're doing um, their language immersions that Catherine talked about earlier. That's an option for our MIA students. Um, and so they go everywhere and anywhere, which is an incredible opportunity. And um, we do have summer reciprocal exchange programs. Um, those are a little bit less common for students, um, but there are still those opportunities. And we also have some capstones that travel internationally as well. Um, and we have capstones that travel to DC too. Um, as she mentioned, there is the profession, or there is the foreign language requirement. Um, and so that is students, they have to pass that foreign exam, that foreign language exam. Um, and they can, you can choose when to do it. And so if you come in with a foreign language experience and you are proficient and you are fluent at that, um, we recommend strongly that you take that test as soon as possible. Um, and so you do not have to wait to take that test. Once, once you're here and you're in classes, you can get that scheduled with the department. Um, if you're fluency level is where it needs to be. And so our research centers and institutes are pretty incredible. Um, the way that they work is they are trying to get you involved. They're trying to get people in front of you and our community. Um, and so we have a few different ones, as you can see on the screen. Um, we also have some that deal a little bit more into our um, Center for, we have a center for nonprofits. And so there are some that aren't mentioned here because um, they tend to work more specifically with our SA programs, um, but they are incredible. They'll bring in speakers, they'll bring in um, incredible, incredible presenters to come through. Um, and there are also opportunities for you to be employed at the centers um, while you are working through your graduate program. Um, whenever you're looking at these centers and institutes, if you want more information, all of that is available on our website. Um, and so I strongly encourage you to try, if you come here, um, 
to try to get involved with our speakers and come because the really the people who come here as speakers are um, it's a different opportunity than is being provided anywhere else in the country. Last year, we had FBI, CIA, and NSA, I think, directors here within a few weeks of each other, um, and that doesn't happen anywhere else. And so um, we work really hard to get you the right speakers who are going to be incredible um, for you. As career services, um, what we do is we work specifically with our students in getting you ready for that career that you are going to be going into. Um, we talk to you about what you want to be doing, where you're going to be going, where you want to be, um, all of those things. And we also help you uh, with the process of applying. So getting your resume where it needs to be, um, doing mock interviews, doing interview prep, um, walking through, making sure your LinkedIn is where it needs to be, all of those pieces. Um, because we have the emphasis on a required internship, um, we have students who are able to engage in that professional realm while they're a student to gain that experience. It can inform where they want to be sector-wise. Um, and so we have a very, very high employment rate. Um, it's generally like that 86 to 99, the few years that I've seen uh, recently with, we've been above 90, um, which is pretty unheard of whenever you're thinking about um, employment rights. And so that's incredible. Um, with our students who are in international affairs program, as you can see, if most of our students will end up going into federal careers. Um, and so we walk through um, how to build a federal resume and things like that. Um, we do have students who go everywhere. We have a, a chunk of students who go private. Um, and that's kind of everything that's outside of federal. And so we do have all of these um, stats and some course and some information about programs and positions on our website as well. Um, some of the most popular and most um, the highest percentage of our employers tend to be, we found out recently through the armed services, armed services. And so it's um, army is one of our highest percentage of employers. Um, but we have students who go pretty much everywhere in the federal government, um, USAID, state, defense, um, DOJ, everything on there. Um, as you can see, we do have government contractors and we are, we have one of our assistant directors in career um, services is our employer relations. And so he works with these um, entities, these departments, these agencies, and gets them on campus in front of you so you can have more information about how to possibly work for them. Um, we also have really strong um, students who work outside the federal government. And so they're working um, as a consultant or they're working in state and local government in emergency management and planning, um, or they're working in Virginia and they're doing things that are that are close enough to being federal government, but are still classified as that private piece. Um, and so we have students who go everywhere. It's not just they're not staying here. Some of our students go internationally um, and work with Foreign Service. And so it really just it really just kind of depends where they want to go. But we have students, I would say, everywhere. Um, and our network is is pretty vast. Um, one of the opportunities for our students to really get involved that we really strongly encourage is our through our student groups. Um, our student groups with PSO and SGA and ambassadors, um, they will bring in speakers a lot of times as well um, to make sure that you are being provided with those professional development opportunities. Um, and these are just some of the student groups. a and actually has over 1,300 student groups, student organizations. Um, it's one of the highest years that they've had. And we're adding more every um, every semester. And so there are places for you to get involved. And this is really, um, like Catherine said earlier, you won't survive if you're on an island of one. And so these uh, these student groups are really a great opportunity for you to find um, find your people. Okay, so we're going to transition to the question and answer portion of this. And you're going to have a choice of either putting those chat messages in the meeting chat on Zoom, or I'll let you unmute in a second. But before I do that, while you're putting together those, just you can check us out online. Don't forget bush.tmu. 
you can contact us. Now, there's two Ashleys. There's Ashley W, who works in career, who just spoke. And then there's Ashley Treadway, Ashley T, who works with me in admissions. And she's the one you'll be contacting if you're applying. If you saw some interest in either the certificates or in the DC office, I've provided you both their emails and their phones, which are on the website as well. And I wanna remind you that we do have more upcoming events. Now, several of you signed up for more of these. So I'll have students come in and they'll be running um, a session on Tuesday, September 26th, to just talk about life as a student. This is gonna focus on the MIA and the MPSA. Um, Ashley and I will come in, the other Ashley, um, we'll come in and we'll talk about admissions and what we're looking for. And again, we'll review that timeline. Um, Matt or Ashley will be coming in with career services and just talk specifically about their fields. I will cover more about financial aid. Now, that's not just Bush School financial aid. That's more about graduate financial aid and what that looks like and some things to consider, some websites to use. Um, so it'll be much more in depth than what I do on these. And then if you just want the overview that has a little bit of everything on it, then those are going to be once a month. I've got October, November, December for that. If you're in this area, um, in the state of Texas, within Texas A&M, whatever, remember, we do have open houses. I've got my first one on Friday. I'll do one of those each month. Those dates are listed there in blue. And I also have an opportunity that every two weeks right now through December, um, it's ask us anything chat hours. So I've got those on the website and on the calendar and you just go in and click on that link at that hour. And Ashley and I, or a student will be there to answer your questions. You can also just email us and ask us and we can get on a chat session. Um, but we're also traveling a little bit. So catch us in any of those events. We'll be happy to talk to you in person. But at this time, I'm just gonna turn off the recording and then I'm gonna start looking to see if there's anything else about um, chat questions that we can do. And I thank you guys for joining us for this and just stay tuned and we will um, take care of all of those. So let me just get this back up and turn off. Thank you guys.